there's lots of evidence out there uh, now that talk about the um, safety of outpatient poppers for low-risk women and suggestion that um, it can in time lead to women's satisfaction and um, uh, low intervention rates because when we're inducing women we're actually sort of increasing the risks of intervention so there's lots of evidence showing that if we offer this as outpatient and women go into her environment hopefully it will reduce <coughs> that intervention so besides the fact that we need the beds on antenatal as Christine said there are uh, evidence that it actually benefits the woman as well without actually affecting the safety. We used to bring the woman in and admit them on antenatal wards and in antenatal wards we had lots of um, high-risk women as well who were there and if we were busy the priority were given to the <coughs> high-risk women naturally and sometimes they were left alone before the propest or prostin where it used to be, be inserted. So actually, what for the woman to be admitted to antenatal ward, standing, hanging around for hours and nothing done to them, uh, can, uh, in, could have increased their uh, stress, which can increase the adrenaline. Offering it as outpatient, we thought we can increase the maternal satisfaction. They come in, they have the propest, and then they can go home, have their own environment, walk around, um, the freedom of eating and drinking whatever they want, mobilizing. It can delay the induction basically and also promotes the normality and more importantly as well is the bed capacities. Um, what we thought we did is we first did an um, audit, we looked at our data to see what we were doing at the moment, looking at the delay in time of the induction then um, we discussed it in our MDT meeting and in there we allocated responsibilities. Then we formulate the guidelines. This was, we hope that we finish, we complete this in eight weeks, but there are some challenges which I'm going to talk about, which we face later on with any changes. We identified the date that we wanted to launch it and communicate with appropriate staff. Training was very important. Continuous audit, because although there are evidence out there that it can improve the woman's satisfaction and it doesn't have an effect on the outcome, it needs a robust uh, system and it needs a robust um, audit to make sure that safety is always the part and what we're doing is right. So we have to make sure that we, we do a continuous audit and evaluation of the system. In your pack, you all have a pack, you can see the timetable we had. The first two weeks we did the audit, discussed it in the uh, MDT meeting, uh, guidelines was formulated, and the important was to make sure that community midwives, because they were the people who were uh, forefront um, um, dealing with the ladies, are aware of it and knew that how to book the woman. So, um, and we also discussed these guidelines with MSLCs um, and communicate with them and told them how the service is going to run because the input is very important of the woman, what do they want. We had a very close um, working with the audit department and making sure that we're continuously auditing it and discuss with them that how we can um, audit what is happening at Kingston. At the moment, we looked at the percentage of inductions for post-date, method of induction, mode of birth, and the time they stayed, SIs and upguards and etc. the outcomes. After our initial audit, um, we found out that at Kingston Hospital, um, <coughs> we had about, um, between 2011 and 2012, we had about 20% of ladies who were induced. And um, the audit showed that 39% of them were induced for post-date, which could have fitted that outpatient propest um, and 22% of them end up having C-section and 70% instrumental of birth. And as, as we know, once we induce the ladies, we increase that um, risk anyway. In the meeting, these were discussed. Uh, we, we had to make sure that somebody uh, would lead the project, which as I said, two of our midwives, band six, is actually were leading that. Then they were allocating responsibilities uh, to different people, um, who's gonna train them, who's gonna write the guidelines. Um, exclusion, inclusion, we had our obstetrician colleagues to put an input in that. 
who's going to prescribe it, where are we going to do it. So all of these needed to be taken into consideration, which is quite a big change and challenge. And writing information leaflets for women. <coughs> we have information leaflets which are quite um, clear and give clear instruction to the women that how the process is going to happen. And um, where, the, where women come and what time they come back to have the propers removed. Challenges, these things. First of all was um, the consultation to the guidelines. We had to have our obstetrician colleagues um, to give us a feedback and tell us what they thought of the guidelines. And um, it was difficult to get them all together and have the same opinion. Most of them had to be discussed via email. <coughs> Another thing was clinical area. Team leaders re reluctant to undertake a pilot because obviously it was extra work. We did the pilot study first, so the women were offered, they were told it's a pilot. We're doing it for a little while just to see the outcome. Um, and they were given a choice at the beginning when we did the pilot whether they want to take a part into the outpatient process or not. And the uh, uptake was quite good actually. Because if you tell the ladies, you know, you have your propest, you go home after half an hour, 40 minutes of monitoring, you know, most of them prefer to be at home in their own environment. The leaflets. And I was told by uh, the midwife who led it, this was the most challenging part, actually, and the long process, because it had to be agreed within our groups, and then it had to go to the trust um, um, information leaflets, and they had to agree with it. So it was quite a sort of a longest process and resistant to change. Change is always a problem in NHS, and this was another one. Um, the doctors who were rotating were quite good, quite recipient, I guess because they go to so many different places, they are used to that change. Um, and there was more from our consultants and from our midwives who sort of found it a little bit difficult to get the grasp of it. Our success was that we had, we got them all involved early and we gave them a pathway of the other trust that were doing it. We got our MSLC colleagues involved, did the training and we had the resources which was good and we had our community midwives on board. They actually, as I said, their participation was very important because they were the lady, they're the one who see the ladies at term and we're offering this service to them. I've just included some example of our um, inclusion criteria. We offer them to all our low risk ladies now. That's 41 ladies who are 41 plus five, between 41 plus five and 42, that's according to the NIAS guidance. People who have no pre-existing medical conditions. Um, they had a normal scan, normal growth, unfavorable cervix, cephalic presentation, maternal age less than 40, and intact membranes. Exclusion, of course, any woman with any medical conditions because they need to be monitored. Uh, BMI more than 35, para 3 or more, 42 plus 1 <coughs> and above, multiple pregnancies, women with uterine scars, so V-backs, any problem with their babies, and women who cannot speak English. That's because we can't ascertain when you're ringing, we can't ascertain when they're in labor, what's happening, it's because that communication, as I said at the beginning, is very important to have a supportive system in place and make sure it's safe. So once these women go home, the communication is very important and they're usually given the information to ring triage. When they ring triage, we take a full history of what's happening. Um, so anybody who cannot speak English, we offer them an inpatient one. This is what we have at the moment, it's the outpatient process assessment. It's about three of them. This one is filled by the community midwives when they're seen at TEM and they offered, uh, TEM plus offered a sweep. They fill this out and then they phone our day assessment unit um, uh, and they book the ladies there uh, to go there to have the outpatient process inserted. Out and it's prescribed by the doctor who works in the, the AU. When they come in, they have an assessment done. That's what is done there. And when they come in to have it removed, they have that form done. Um, our future plan is, as I said, to offer it to women over 40. Um, we need to, we in process of doing an audit, we haven't done an audit in women's satisfaction because that was our initial thought of, and lots of research saying increases a woman's satisfaction. We haven't done it yet at Kingston. We're in progress of doing it. 
and we also are thinking how we can exclude these women in our system because although they are in a diary in the AU that they're outpatient purpose, in our system, which is CRS, it's hard to exclude them. So the OTs we've done so far is pull everybody's notes who was in, in juice and then pick <coughs> up the outpatient purpose. So hopefully with the CRS updates, which is next year, BNC, we can sort of put this at the tick. So it's going to make the audit much easier and we, we can actually see the outcome. From the audits we've done um, nine months last year, the outcome was no difference. We had no BBAs, we had no uh, outwards for SIs or anything. Um, so it worked quite well at Kingston within the last two years. Done.